<laughs> All right, how's everybody doing? All right, cool. All right, I'm going to pass around the sign-in sheet. Um, in, in bold letters at the top, it says, fill in the circle to the left. So please fill in the circles to the left. I managed to get them so they're not cut off this time. Um, so, so sign next to your name, but fill in that circle, okay? It helps me record your, your attendance. Um, so that's going around. <coughs> All right, so what I want to do today is talk about the next ODP. Okay, I want to go through what that's supposed to do. I want to talk about if statements and for loops in bash. Um, along with functions. Um, and then I want to mainly talk about the service learning project. Okay, because your first deliverable for that is coming up um, next week, I believe. Um, so before we get into that, any questions? All right, well, let's look at the ODP for today. So this is 406, and there was no 405. So ODP 406, you're going to write a script that does the following. It silently waits for you to enter a number, and you can assume it's a positive integer the person will type in. And then it prints out a series of vertical bars followed by that number in parentheses. So this is part of your PA1, right? So type in the name of the script. It should just wait for you to enter a number such as 5. And then it should print out five pipes, followed immediately by a left paren, the number five, and a right paren. And so I can show you what this looks like. So I called my script S1. So I run S1, and it waits for me to type in a number. And I type the number 10. And it prints out 10 pipes, followed by a 10 in parentheses, and then it just exits. Okay, and that's got to be exactly what it produces. So if I type in a 1, it just prints 1, followed by a 1 in parentheses. If I put in a 0, it doesn't print any pipes, and it prints a 0 in parentheses. I put in a big number, and then <laughs> theoretically that would work. All right, is that clear? I think I'm not going to test it with negative numbers, but you can do that. If, if you don't do anything special, this is probably what it will do. So what are you going to do? You're going to do either a for loop or a while loop, right? And basically, for i equals 1 to n, where n is the number that you put in, um, do your echo dash n pipe, and it'll print a pipe, but it won't go down to a new line, right? So you can do that echo dash n inside a while loop, and it'll print pipe, 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 pipe. And then when you get to the end of it, just echo parentheses, dollar sign, whatever your argument was, right, whatever variable the number n is in, and then a close paren. What happens if you do the dash n inside parentheses? Or, or inside the quotations? Oh, then it's just, um, then it's just part of the string. So the dash n is a switch to echo. Okay. And then the thing in quotation marks is an argument, a command line argument to echo. All right, good on that. So let's do it at 8 in the morning. All right, let's talk about if statements. So let's just play with a script. So I'll just say enter something and you're going to read whatever the person types in. We're going to save it in a variable named stuff. Um, all 
All right, so your if statement is the word if, space, bracket, bracket, space, and then whatever condition you want to check, space, close, bracket, bracket. Next line, then, and then whatever statements you want to do if that condition was true. Um, and then the word fee, if spelled backwards, that's your closing brace. So here our script is going to let the user type something, and if what they typed is empty, right, if they just hit enter, then it should say you didn't enter anything and goodbye. So if I run this, it says enter something, I can say hello, and it just exits, right, because we didn't tell it what to do. But if I just hit enter, then it says you didn't enter anything, goodbye. And you can find this in the cheat sheet on Canvas. So I, I've been pointing people to this cheat sheet. Um, if, while, for, et cetera, in bash. So here's the section on if statements. So if condition then, things to do if the condition is true, fee. And your condition, remember, if you're comparing strings, collections of characters, and you just want to know, is this collection of characters exactly the same as that collection? You use double equal or use exclamation mark equal for not equal. And put these things in quotation marks. Okay, if you say, quote, dollar sign x, x will still get replaced with the value of the variable x. Um, but get in the habit of using quotation marks for this because it lets you put in things that have spaces in them and so on and so forth. If you're comparing numbers, then you have to use one of these six, dash EQ, dash NE, and so on to compare, and you don't want quotation marks there. All right, we can also say if, then, else. And so this works something like this. Now, if what they entered was blank, then we'll say you didn't enter anything goodbye. Otherwise, we'll thank them for saying whatever they said. So if you don't enter anything, it does the same thing. And if you say something, then it says, thanks for saying hello. And the other thing you can do is you can do an else if. And an else if, the only trick is the keyword is E-L-I-F instead of saying else if. Um, so if condition, then things to do if it's true. Elif, a new condition, then things to do if that's true. And you can put another else if and so on and so forth. And if you want, you could have a final else statement afterwards and then fee to end the whole thing. say anything it'll tell you otherwise if you say bye it'll say how rude otherwise it'll say thanks and this has got to be well let's just try it like this all right so it's got to be that elif and you know if i run this and i don't well even that doesn't work okay so else if So that happens if you say nothing, that happens if you say anything random, this is what happens if you say bye. So this is just a, a regular if statement, right? This is, this is similar to what you would do in MATLAB or C or Java or anything else. It's just the peculiar syntax of bash. And really the only trick to doing ifs in bash is, is nailing that syntax. So feel free to come to this cheat sheet to uh, to remind yourself of the format. And there's examples down here of specifics. And we can also do multiple conditions. 
we can put things together in this condition block. Um, Somewhere in here. Okay, combining conditions. So if bracket bracket, condition, close bracket bracket, space, and then you can do double ampersands for an and, you can do double pipes for an or. And I'll mention for loops, but for loops have a different syntax. In Bash, if you want to do a for loop, it's for and it's double parentheses and then closing parentheses. You don't need all the extra spaces. You don't need dollar signs on the variables inside the parentheses. And you can do things like plus plus or less than sign for less than and so on and so forth. But I don't usually talk about for loops much because it's this different syntax from while loops and if statements. Right? And you never need a for loop. You can do for loops with a while statement. It's kind of cool to do because you make your own for loop. Um, so if you don't like fors, don't worry about them. Otherwise, you got to remember, is this the one where I need to use the dollar sign or not? Is this the one where I say dash LT or do I use a less than sign? And it's just another thing to get confused about. So if you're going to do this, I suggest putting it on your, your note sheet somewhere. Um, for exams and keep it somewhere beside you for writing code. Um, or just don't worry about fours. But if you want one, there it is. All right. And functions, we can define functions in Bash to take a bunch of things, a bunch of commands, and bundle them into a single callable function. Um, and so function, space, name of the function, space, curly bracket. So there's a function with three instructions in it. First it's going to say this is funny, and then it's going to say today is without a new line at the end, and then it's going to execute the date command. And this is a function named ha ha, so if I say ha ha, it goes ahead and it executes those three instructions. Does this save it as a file? No, this is just a, a function in memory, and this will go away when I log out. Uh, okay. But if you put this inside a script, right, if you define it inside a script, then you can use it in that script, and it's it's defined every time you run the script. Hmm. And that's usually where we use functions. So it's a way to just sort of, if you're going to constantly do these five things over and over and over again, you could make a function once called, you know, five things I do all the time. And then instead of typing those five lines everywhere that you want, you just type the name of the function. So just like a function in C, for example. And you can pass arguments to functions. So. Here's a function called hello. So the function hello. Um, um, if you pass an argument to a function, that argument's available in dollar sign one, the next argument is in dollar sign two, and so on just like when you run a shell script. So here's a function called hello that will say hello back and it'll print out whatever the first argument was. So I can say hello Nick, uh, lowercase, hello Nick, and it says hello back Nick. Yeah? What if you want the function itself to read in a value? Uh, you put a read statement in. Okay.
So if I run double, I can put in a number and it'll print that out. Gotcha. Or Do you, you can double just a string. Um, if I try to put in a string, it'll treat it as a zero. And here's a command line argument version of double, which takes dollar sign one, which is the argument, <coughs> multiplies by two, and then it goes that. So now if I say double 17, it prints out 34. If I say double ha ha, it'll print out zero. If I just say double, it'll complain because dollar sign one is missing. And it got weird syntax. So questions about bash stuff, scripting, language. You don't have to use functions, but people have been asking about them, so I wanted to mention them. Yeah? So if you're going to use like a parameter argument in a mm -hmm. function like that, do you have to declare the type or anything? Nope. Okay. Yeah, bash rarely needs you to specify types of things, which can be good or bad. <laughs> How does it handle the decimals? Um, if I said something like double 5.6, um, that gives me an error. How do you fix that? Mm. Well, that gets tricky. That's a tricky one to fix. The ones like haha -ha are pretty straightforward. But you start getting into weird parsing questions, like you look at the string of characters and say, is this a valid integer? I mean, this, this would be easy. This particular case is easy to pick up because you can search for a period inside the string. You can use a utility called grep. Oh, so it stores it as a string? Everything is a string in bash, right? Um, dollar sign one is a string, but if I put it inside this dollar sign paren paren, it'll treat it like an integer. And what's happening here is it's not an integer, it's 5.6. But every variable in bash is basically a string, right? There's no, there's no integer type per se. So at this point, num is a collection of characters. It might be the character 5 followed by the character 2, which looks like the number 52, but it's really a collection of characters. But if I do something like um, like that, all right, that's saying let's treat num as being an integer. And let's add one to it. And that would give me this value 53. And when I set num equal to that, num's equal to a string containing two characters, a 5 followed by a 3. If it was a string, would it, um, would it add, append one to it? or? Um, it will treat the number as 0 when it tries to convert it to an integer. So normal business is that, right? Something that doesn't convert to an integer, it just treats as a zero. If the string has an integer in it, is it going to find that? All right, so this is, this is interesting because we can input numbers in different bases, right? 
Um, but it understands negatives. And it doesn't like periods. So usually in this course, I'm not going to be really, really heavy on weird error checking. Okay, for example, on the ODPs, I'm saying you can assume the input is a valid integer. Um, in PA1, the only integers they can put in are um, either 1, 2, or 3 for how many sticks to take, or in the beginning, they'll put in a number of integers, and I won't give you something with a period inside. Um, yeah? So for the programming assignments, since you're grading them yourself, mm -hmm. are you as strict or thorough on like the specifics of it, of it as no. ODP? Okay. So, so the programming assignments, the two-week assignments, I grade by hand. So if you have an extra space in the output compared to what's on the assignment, that's not going to trip me up. But here's what will trip me up. If, if I'm supposed to type in a lowercase u or a lowercase c to say user or computer, and your code needs an uppercase U or an uppercase C, that's going to cost you points, okay? Because that's, that's definitely outside the described behavior. Um, and I notice that because I end up playing the matchsticking game, you know, probably 500 times that weekend, right? 62 students, and I play several games on each of your programs. Um, and if, if I, you know, run your code and I put in a number and I put in a lowercase u and it does something weird, right, then I notice that and then I got to, like, actually think. So I'll definitely pick up on that. But no, the very, very nitty-picky is there a colon after this or not, right, that's not a problem. Yeah? If we turn it in early, are you able to give us feedback for us to recreate it? I don't like doing that. Okay. Um, if, if you have something very particular that you're worried about, you can ask me that. Okay. Right? Like, I didn't know if it should do this or that, right? And then I might say, let's see what it does. I get it. But, yeah. All right, other questions? All right, so let's talk about the service learning project. Yay. Yay. So some of you may have heard of this. I have no idea if I want to join that course or not. Um, all right, service learning project, 15% of your course grade. So what is this all about? Um, basically, you know, you're in college, you're taking courses, your courses include various assessments, so usually homeworks or other assignments, um, tests that you take, exams, things like that. Um, generally, the work you're doing in courses like this is very, very structured for you, right? Like programming assignment one. Here's what it should do. It should play the matchsticking game. Here's how it should work. Here's what the input should be, what the output should be. Here's the algorithm for helping the computer win the game. Here's when it's due, okay? And I'm giving you ODPs that build up to the program. So by eight o'clock tomorrow, you should have written bash code that handles the part of your program that prints out a picture of the matches, right? With the number of matches in parentheses. Um, Tomorrow you'll work on an ODP that lets the user put in a number and decides whether they put in a valid number, whether they put in one, two, or three, and checks to see if, if they're putting in something illegal twice in a row. Okay, so, so this is very structured for you, all right? Um, an interesting thing happens when you finish with school, or at some point you branch off into the workplace, the equation completely changes. Right? In school, you're required to work on your assignments, projects, exams completely alone. Don't talk to anybody. And close your books. You're not allowed to use your book during the exam. Right? So write some code and don't look at any of your notes or resources or talk to anybody who might help you. Right? That's not what happens in the workplace. Workplace is completely opposite. We want you to write this code in the best possible way, so use whatever resources you need. You know, go online and post your question and get some help. Talk to your colleagues. Review your notes, you know, whatever. 
it's a very different situation. Okay, same thing with large scale projects. Um, in the classroom, your projects are specifically described to you. Here's what you need to do. Here's the full spec. Here's the deadline, and so on and so forth. That's not what happens in the workplace, or in a research environment, or you know, in graduate school, or things like that. In these settings, you're usually hired. For example, you're a game developer, right? Your job is to come up with a really cool game. Um, your boss is not going to come in and say, "Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do for this game." Okay, I'd like you to take this code and, you know, make some changes to it by tomorrow morning, right? You're there because you're the person who can do these things. You're the programmer, you're the designer, you're the system architect, whatever you are. Um, your boss is not going to come in and tell you how to do your job, right? They may not even come in and tell you what to do. Depending on your work situation, you may be there to come up with a solution to some very general problem. You got to figure out what the solution is, and then maybe you got to implement it, and then maybe you got to figure out how to test it, and you got to figure out how long it's going to take you, and you got to say, okay, I can get version one done by this date, and it's going to take this long to test, and I can do revisions up until this date, and so on, right? So it's a very different situation for the classroom. So the SLP is really designed to sort of mimic some of that sort of more real world outside of the classroom behavior. Um, so what's the basic setup? This is a long-term project. It's a project you're going to start now and you're going to finish about a week before you graduate. Okay, June, um, if you're graduating this year. It's a project that you're going to decide what it is and what it isn't. What am I going to do on this? What is in scope? What's out of scope? It's a project that you're going to set the timeline for. You're going to specify how much am I going to get done by this date, by that date. How am I going to decide at this point in time whether I've succeeded or not? Right? What's the measure of success by the end of this quarter or by the middle of next quarter? Um, this is all up to you. And these are the kinds of skills that employers love. These are the kinds of skills when you're applying for a fellowship or a scholarship or a grant or something that are considered really, really valuable. Because it means that you can do more than just follow instructions. You can actually take the lead. You can actually self-manage. And that's, that's just priceless to an employer. Right? That's what's going to put you above the other people who are competing with you. Um, so the SLP is a project of your choosing that you want to basically work on for the next three quarters. And it can be almost anything, okay? It does not have to be a programming assignment just because you're computer science. It can include software. It might not include any software. It can be hardware. It can build on something that already exists. It can be something completely new. So what are the constraints? It should be something that you're interested in. Because 40 weeks is a long time. That's almost a year. Okay, three quarters of school plus the breaks in between. It's a lot of time. And ideally, you're working on this at least every week. Ideally, every few days. Right? And you're taking time. I'm done with my physics homework. I'm done with my ODP. I've got some free time now. Should I go out and you know hang out with my friends, or should I work on my SLP? Okay. Hopefully, sometimes the SLP wins, and you're spending some time on it each week. So you want it to be something that you're actually interested in spending time on. And this is one reason that we don't assign an SLP. Okay, it's, it's something that you choose and you present it and we, we agree on what it is you're going to do. Um, it should be something that takes you beyond the scope of what you're doing in your classes. So it shouldn't be, you know, taking a homework assignment that we've already done and redoing it. Okay, or a lab or something like that. It should be something that goes further, something that requires you to learn things from outside of your regular classroom experience. So classic example, right? Let's say you want to make a video game, okay? And this is one that a lot of people go for. Um, we don't teach video game design in the curriculum here. 
there's engines out there you can take unity or unreal or some other engines and you can do video game design in that um, some of these use c sharp some of them use um, c plus plus some of them use python right we don't teach those languages in here so you would need to learn how to use this game development engine you would need to learn whatever language you have to work in to write code in this um, if you're building a game that's going to use an Xbox controller you need to learn how to interface that to whatever platform you're developing on usually a PC um, if you want a wireless controller you need to learn something about wireless communication um, and maybe you need to build some circuitry. Maybe you need to take one of the PIC processors from 270 and, and add a wireless component to it and use that as an interface. Um, and as you start digging into this, right, the problem space can explode, which is good. <laughs> okay, you want lots of things to choose from. But ultimately, you want to be very specific about what am I going to do for my SLP. Because scope creep is... is a huge problem for creative people right you just start chasing one challenge after another and it's fun chasing challenges and working on them and figuring them out but after a few months of this you might find that you're like you know way way downfield from where you started off and you're not actually working on your SLP anymore you're just having fun which is cool um, but you want to you want to be able to be able to sort of direct your work towards some goal all right, so the first part of this is coming up with a project proposal. And so this is the deliverable that's due October 11th is your, um, your SLP proposal. And this is version one because um, we'll, we'll review this together and iterate on it. And you can make changes and then do a version two and a version three and so on. So this is due October 11th, and this is the template for it. So the first page is the instructions. You can toss those and then fill in the second page. Uh, and this all just says what I've been saying. So what's your proposal look like? Okay, put your full name on the top. Always use your full name unless you're officially only have one name, right? No initials, no nicknames. Put your full name on here, whatever name you go by. Okay, and that can be, you know, doesn't have to match your legal name um, but but we've got people with the same last name we've got lots of people with the same initials right so first name last name is is clearest um, so your name class is CSE 224 the date that you're doing this name of your project okay it can be a working name but you know SLP is kind of dry sounding so pick a name for your project just so we can refer to it list the full names of all your partners that you're working with Okay, you can work with two other people without getting an extra permission. If you want to work in a larger group, we need to talk about it because we want to make sure that, that it makes sense to break the project into more pieces. Thanks. Um, so the names of the people you're working with. All right, detailed project description. This is probably the largest piece of the proposal. It's not a sentence, okay? So you're gonna need more space than is there. So keep typing and you know fill it in. Um, this is the pitch that you make to the billionaire that you bump into on the street and you help them change a tire on their car. And when they're done, they're like, you know, hand you their business card and say, yeah, I'm a billionaire. If you ever got anything you want to spend money on, hit me up, you know. And you're like, well, actually, I have this great idea. <laughs> Bang, that's when you go into your elevator pitch, right? Super that's what you put here, okay? So what is it that you want to do? So more than, yeah, I want to make a game. It'll be probably a first-person shooter set in space, and it'll be really cool. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> okay. No. So, so enough detail to like really, really nail down what is it that you're gonna do? There's gonna be flames and joystick, and it'll have haptic feedback, and it'll, you know, shock you when you get hit by someone, and, and it'll be totally awesome, and you'll have goggles, and you know, immersive. Yeah. So, um, description of of the project. Okay, as detailed as you can. Now, now this is probably a project that you're just thinking about. 
So you're not going to have schematic diagrams and algorithms and code and all this kind of stuff, right? But spend some time, right? You got about two weeks until this was due. Spend some time developing in your brain. Daydream. Use your imagination. What would you like to do, right? Um, shooting too high is a problem, but it's not as much of a problem as shooting too low. Okay, if you lowball your expectations, chances are you're not going to exceed wherever you set that bar. If you set your expectations way up here, yeah, you might not make that, but you know what? You're probably going to get higher than you realize. So daydream. Imagine, what do I want to do? I have no idea how to do it, but this is what I want. All right? So, so work out those details. Um, most challenging expected expect elements and expected learning outcomes. What are you going to learn in doing this? Right? So you should be doing something that stretches your learning or your understanding of something. It shouldn't be something that you know how to do right now today or something that you've already done. So what do you expect to learn from this? Um, description of service component. It's a service learning project, right? It's a project that should be beneficial to other people in some way. Um, how is it going to benefit other people? And you can always find a service component, right? Video games help students relax and de-stress so they can work better on their homework. Um, whatever. Um, if it's a new project that you have not done any work on, you can say it's a new project. If it's something that you've already been working on, just let me know what the current status is. Right? If you're making a video game and it's already finished and all you got to do is come up with a name, that's probably not a really good 40-week project. Okay? Um, but you know, I've done some, pro I went through a tutorial on Unity and, and I followed their first example and I got that working. Okay, well that's good to know. That's where you're starting from. Alright, the next section is critical. These are the milestones. So milestones, right? You're walking on a, a path through the woods and there's these stone markers sticking out of the ground with numbers on them. Those are milestones. What do they do? They let you know where you are along this path. This is a six mile path and there's milestone four. I'm two thirds of the way there. I'm out of food and water and I'm about to faint. Okay, that's not good. Or, you know, I feel like I just started walking. Okay, I'm like in really good shape, so. It lets you know where you are. It's exactly what milestones do on a project. So the worst feeling is you're coming up to the deadline, your project is due in two weeks, and you haven't really done anything on it. And it's like, well, I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do, and I gotta do the research, right? That's a horrible feeling. Um, especially if somebody's paying you to do this project and now they're gonna want their money back. <laughs> okay. Um, so milestones for a project are basically like those markers in the ground. They're things that let you know clearly at certain points, am I ahead of schedule, behind schedule, on schedule. So I want at least three milestones for this proposal. You can do more if it makes sense. One is for midway through the term, October 23rd. The second is for the end of the term, November 25th. And the third is for whatever date in the future you want. It could be the beginning of winter quarter. It could be, um, you know, January 1st, whatever. Um, and the milestone needs a measure of success. Okay, so you should name what the milestone is. Uh, so game development. I will have completed a tutorial. I'll have picked a game engine. Okay, I'll have completed a first tutorial on that game engine. And I'll have written at least one um, small game using that tutorial. Okay. And I'd like to do that by October 23rd, or maybe that's an end of quarter one. Maybe by mid-quarter I want to have looked at at least two different game engines and decided which one I'm going to use. And then by end of quarter I want to have gone through a tutorial and written at least one game using their examples. Okay, Those are well-defined and clearly measurable milestones. And the goal is on October 23rd, you can look at your milestone, you can look at your measure of success and say, have I achieved this milestone? And if you have, that's perfect. Okay. If you haven't, then you're behind schedule. And you can say, okay, should I be spending more time on my SLP? Should I adjust my project because I don't have as much time as I thought? Or this is a harder problem than I realized. Right? It lets you make adjustments so that hopefully by the end of June, end of the, uh, the spring quarter, right, you're at whatever point you wanted to be at. So these need to be clearly defined and, and easily measurable. So for example, if your measure of success says the first part is done, that's not clearly measurable. What does that mean, first part is done? 
That could mean I picked a name for the project, or I decided who to work with, or it could mean I finished a prototype, right? Um, schematics are completed, that's a measurable milestone. Do I have my schematics? Yes, I do. Well, I have half a schematic, but it's missing part, okay? Um, have a good idea what I want to do is not measurable, right? What constitutes having a good idea what I want to do? Uh, complete a written description of the project that clearly states the project's goals, that's a measurable milestone, okay? So you want these so that if you were being funded by someone, you could give to them something by October 23rd and they could look at the measure of success and say, okay, you're still on target, here's your next chunk of money, continue. Okay, now there's nobody doing that, that's for you. Okay, but it's to let you know if you're making progress on the schedule. Does that make sense? All right, so think about milestones. This is sometimes the hardest part of the proposal. Once you have an idea, is figuring out what's a reasonable timeline. And we don't expect you to nail all of this first try, right? This is largely about figuring out how to do something like this proposal. And we expect that in most cases, you know, you don't know how to pick a milestone or a date or things like that. So it's a process of figuring this out, right? So that by the time you get closer to the end of the whole SLP in spring quarter, right, you're pretty good at, at being able to guess how much progress you're going to make when, and you can set expectations based on that. All right, major challenges anticipated. This should be a project that is going to be challenging to you. If you, you know, built your first PC when you were 12 years old and you've been doing this for years, um, an SLP, I'm going to build my own PC, is probably not sufficiently challenging. Okay. On the other hand, if you've never touched any piece of hardware in your life and you want to do something that involves putting things together to make a PC, that's a decent starting point at least. Right? We would probably add some things to it. But it really depends on your experience. But whatever your experience is, we want this to be something that challenges you. Okay. Um, and then just talk about why you chose this project, right? which again is partially for you to think about why do I want to do this. And sometimes you think about that, it's like, you know what, I really don't want to do this. I'm just doing this because it was the first thing I thought of. So think about why you chose this project. What are your specific interests that relate to this project? Again, you know, is this something that, that is going to make sense for you to spend time on? What do you hope to learn from this? It's a learning experience. Um, and what benefit do you think this will have to your education? All right, so it's a big project. Um, and like I say, ideally it's a project that you're spending some amount of time on each week um, for 11 weeks here and 10 weeks in your winter and 10 weeks in the spring and maybe more time in between quarters if it's something you're really excited about working on. So how do you think this is going to benefit your education? Okay, so there's no right or wrong per se in this. It's a proposal, but typically people will turn this in and the project description is not detailed. Okay, it's something like, I'm going to learn to use an Arduino and build a piece of hardware with it. Okay, well, good starting point, let's add more, right? Or the milestones aren't specific. Mid-quarter, I'll be halfway done. End of quarter, I'll be done with the first part. Right? Not measurable. So, um, so what will typically happen is you'll turn in your version 1 proposal, and I'll look it over, and I might say, okay, that looks pretty good, but you need to add more information here and here. So there's a version 2 you can turn in by the 16th, and if that's still missing some things, we'll say, okay, let's turn in version 3 by the 18th, and that's sort of your final, final version of your proposal. And the proposal total is worth 25 points. Okay, and if version 1 is fine, then you get 25 points for the whole thing. If version 1 is, is fine, but you need more, then you get 10 points on version 1, and version 2 you get 10 or 15 points on. And ultimately, right, so it doesn't matter if you get it on the first try or the third try. Okay, if your proposal is fully acceptable, it's worth 25 points. All right, your final upload, we can look at this in detail closer to the end of the quarter, but it's basically a one-page PowerPoint poster, and it looks like those posters you see in the hallway down by the Nerd Cave. Those are SLP posters. Um, and you turn that in by the 25th, we print those out for you. And then the last Tuesday of the quarter, which is December 3rd this term, um, at 3 o'clock there's an expo out in the digital lounge. 
and we basically give you your poster and you find a table and you hang out there for two hours, three o'clock to five o'clock, and people come by and they look at your posters and they talk to you about your project. And this is really, really valuable. This is really where you sort of learn the most about your project yourself. Because when you try to explain this to other people or answer questions about it, that's when you start to look at it differently. Right? Typically when you think about a project, you're thinking about it from one perspective, which is very internal. Um, it's the outside feedback that really sort of forces you to go in different directions. So the presentation is, is really valuable to you in addition to letting other people know what you've been working on. So the presentation, it's the last Tuesday, Digital Lounge 3 to 5. If for some reason you are not going to be able to make that, if your work schedule or some other constraint says you can't be here on a Tuesday afternoon from 3 to 5, um, you have to let me know this week by email. Okay, I gotta have it in writing. And we can arrange a different way for you to present your SLP. Okay, but you can't come to me the day before this presentation, week 10, and say, uh, I've got a physics class at three o'clock. I can't come to this. Okay, unless you just added the physics class that week, you should know this now. So tell me about it now. Okay, so look at your schedules and, and see if that's going to be a problem. Uh, do we need to attend the entire duration? Uh, if possible, yeah. If, if you've got to leave 15 minutes early or something, right, that's okay. But, but I'd like you to plan on being there 3 to 5. I just right now, off the top of my head, uh, Gray's physics class is basically 3 to 5. The lecture? Yeah. It's uh, 4 to 6. Yeah. 4 to 6. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to get out of it. So, so yeah, so, like so, so if you don't think you can be there the whole two hours, right, send me an email and say, you know, a physics class at four, and so come for an hour. Yeah. So, say if you were to work in a group, mm -hmm. um, like video games or something like that, and you were to do, like, say, the art or the writing or something like that, mm -hmm. would that count for an SLP? Like, would your role have to necessarily include programming? Um, ideally, it would be something related to your course coursework here, right? Um, and going beyond it. So yeah, artwork would be part of it. Um, but I would probably say I want to see more than just that. Um, something that would involve programming or circuitry or something like that. But we can talk about it, right? So this this is I plan for this to be a back and forth conversation. So don't feel too constrained in your first version, right? And if you're not sure, shoot me an email, come by office, um, and we can talk about it before you write it up if you want to. Should throw up a Discord channel, like just named SLP, then people can discuss yeah, stuff. Yeah, I can do that. And then you could like recruit people for a project and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll throw that up. All right, other questions? All right, so tomorrow, um, tomorrow I want to start looking at programming assignment one as far as algorithms. And I want to think about what are the steps that we want to use to make this matchstick ticking game work. And we'll go from there to start talking about what we call pseudocode. And we'll do some exercises in class and start looking at algorithm design. All right, cool. I'll see you next time. Yeah.